Hi, Ed. Thank you very much for joining us today. I recently read an article in Barron's which featured price targets for the S&P for 2024, and you were the most bullish, and you've been right. bullish for quite some time now. What exactly did you see in the economy that made you bullish? Well, I've been on the other side of the debate uh, with regards to a recession. There's been a lot of pessimism in the U.S. Uh, about a recession as a, as a result of the Fed raising interest rates so aggressively. I mean, it's a logical uh, story that uh, if the Fed's going to raise interest rates by as much as they did over 500 basis points in a very short period of time, uh, wouldn't that cause a recession? And, and I've been arguing since the beginning of last year that, yes, indeed, we are in a recession. It's just a rolling recession affecting different industries at different times while other industries are doing well. So uh, clearly the first industry that got hit was housing at the beginning of last year, but it was really single family housing. Multifamily was doing quite well. And meanwhile, overall construction employment just kept going up and up and up to new record highs. So clearly there's other kind of construction going on like infrastructure and uh, onshoring spending for manufacturing facilities. Uh, we had a, a goods recession in retailing uh, because people went on a buying binge after the lockdowns. Everybody kind of got cabin fever, and the best way to relieve cabin fever is to go shopping. And so uh, we all went shopping. We couldn't really buy services because there were still social distancing restrictions there. And so everybody bought goods. And then uh, it was kind of by the time the, the next batch of goods arrived and they all got clogged up in the West Coast ports and the, there weren't enough trucks, uh, people just had already pivoted to, to, to services. So I, I'm not looking for a recession next year. I'm looking for uh, rolling recoveries. I mean, clearly housing is going to recover with interest rates uh, coming down. I think the goods recession is uh, is bottoming. I think the consumers are still in good shape and capital spending continues to get lifted by onshoring. So I, I think the economy continues to grow. I think earnings continue to grow. I think valuation multiples stay high because more than a quarter of S&P 500 is in uh, eight names. And they uh, tend to have a very high valuation multiple, the so-called, well, some people call them Magnificent Seven. I call them the Mega Cap Eight because I like to watch movies and I review them uh, on a weekly basis. So I'm, I got Netflix in there. You make a lot of very interesting points, Ed. Why do you think it is so many people, so many pundits have been so negative, though? Because if you go mm -hmm. back just to Q1 of this year, right. And I'm sure you recall, but there was a big crisis associated with the regional banking system, and and people thought that's it. This is what's going to take down the whole system. Right. But w what indicators do you think that these other pundits are seeing that's yeah. made them so negative? Well, I, again, first and foremost, it was hard to imagine that with the Fed uh, scrambling to raise interest rates to get ahead of the inflation curve after falling behind it, that that wouldn't cause a recession, and then. There were lots of indicators pointing in that direction, the uh, so-called inverted yield curve. Uh, we saw that uh, short-term rates uh, rose faster than uh, long-term uh, bond yields, and that's in the past been a pretty good signal of a recession coming. Uh, I've been arguing that uh, the, the problem with that indicator is it doesn't forecast recessions, it, re it really forecasts a process that leads to recessions. So uh, why would anybody in their right mind buy a 10-year bond yield at 4% when they could get 5% uh, in the two year? Well, the answer is they think that if the Fed keeps raising interest rates, something will break in the financial system and uh, that'll lead to a credit crunch and a recession. And so now's a good time to buy the bonds because you're never gonna be able to pick the top in short-term interest rates. Um, well, we did, uh, the, the yield curve was actually quite accurate. We did get a, a financial crisis in March of, uh, of uh, this year, 2023, uh, but it didn't last very long. Uh, Fed came and contained it uh, very effectively. You know, the, the the Fed has a lot of experience with playing that arcade game called whack-a-mole. So here, this uh, mold jumped up in the banking sector and they whacked it uh, pr pretty rapidly. And so that did not turn into a credit crunch, did not turn into a, a recession. Uh, I think uh, also forecasters have underestimated the resilience of the consumer. Uh, even uh, somebody as knowledgeable and plugged in as Jamie D uh, Diamond of uh, uh, JP Morgan uh, last uh, spring, uh, spring of 2022, was going around saying consumers are in good shape now, but they're going to run out of their excess saving piled up during the pandemic uh, from a couple of months of 
saving because they couldn't go shopping and uh, three rounds of stimulus checks deposited in, in millions of people's uh, bank accounts. So uh, Mr. Diamond figured that um, they'd run out of that excess saving sometime around now, uh, before now, and that that would uh, for force them to retrench. I've been arguing that excess savings is not the only source of purchasing power for their consumer. I mean, consumers have spent without having excess savings in the past. It's jobs and it's real wages, wages relative to prices. And uh, real wages stagnated uh, uh, during the pandemic, but this year they've been starting to rise again. Wages have been rising faster than prices. Uh, gasoline prices have come down, which has got a lot of influence on people's inflation psyche. Uh, but uh, they also, consumers have also uh, been uh, beneficiaries of a very tight labor market, which remains fairly tight. I mean, it's not as tight as it was a year ago, but there's still plenty of job openings, and uh, especially for skilled workers. So put that all together, and uh, you got an economy that's been uh, much more resilient than the pessimists uh, expected. There's a lot to unpack there, and I want to talk about energy prices and also the jobless rate. But before we do that, why don't sure. we first discuss the Fed, the last Fed meeting of the year, which was held last week. What were your takeaways from that meeting in the comments? Yeah, well, it was sort of a strange meeting because uh, this, everybody was surprised that uh, the so-called summary of economic projections, which reflects the consensus uh, estimates of uh, the Fed funds rate and the economy by the uh, participants at the meeting, uh, suddenly called for three rate cuts next year of 25 basis points each, whereas uh, qu the quarter before that, it's released on a quarterly basis. So it's the September SEP called for uh, two uh, rate cuts in uh, 2024. And so that was a, a big surprise, especially since uh, until that meeting, the, the Fed Chair Powell and other Fed officials had been going out of their ways to convince the markets that uh, while they might be done raising interest rates, they're in, in no rush to lower them. And they're not even thinking about thinking about uh, l lowering uh, interest rates. And then all of a sudden we get uh, three, three rate cuts instead of two rate cuts as, as their forecast. Now, Powell tried to uh, soften that, that, that uh, dubbish uh, effect on the market by saying, look, uh, we don't discuss it. Everybody just kind of gives their own view of things. But uh, they're very aware of what uh, how important communication is how, for them to communicate with the markets. And it was really a, a botched job because as we've seen ever since uh, that meeting, Fed officials uh, after Powell's press conference have been uh, going around trying to convince everybody that they're still not thinking about raising interest rates. And they don't know when they're even going to start uh, lowering interest rates. So uh, I, I think they they, they kind of uh, blew it. Uh, you know, it was just not, not uh, very effective. But look, the reality is, um, you know, the, we, we all we're all data dependent, and the data is showing that inflation is moderating, and that uh, the Fed had, uh, is done most likely done raising interest rates. And so the, the the pivot has been instead of discussing will there be another rate hike. We're now talking about how many rate cuts we will have next year. That's a that's a major change, and it's uh, obviously been bullish for bonds and stocks. So, Ed, you are correct when you say inflation is moderating at around four yeah. percent, but nonetheless, the economy is still very strong, growing at five percent annualized. The jobless rate is around three point seven percent, maybe right. lower than that now. But are you not concerned that, given how strong the economy is, that inflation might not heat up again, and therefore there would be a Mm -hmm. a need to in, increase interest rates again? Well, um, while uh, the debate on interest rates has swung from, you know, how many more rate hikes to how many rate cuts are ahead of us uh, next year, uh, I'm of the opinion that um, we're not going to have as many as the market anticipates because I think the economy is going to remain resilient. Not, not as strong as it was in the third quarter. It, it looked like a bit of an aberration. looks like the economy has grown around two and a half, maybe 3% if productivity is uh, kick, kicking in. But look, uh, inflation has in fact turned out to be transitory, especially in the good side. Uh, goods inflation is down to zero on a year over year percent change. Uh, the main problem has been in services, particularly in, uh, in rents, which has a very high weight uh, in, this, in the CPI. And that's going to that's starting to come down as well. So, uh, you know, depending on how you slice and dice the inflation numbers, uh, the inflation rate uh, is either four percent on a 
kind of a core PCED basis, or it's more like 2% if you take out shelter in the this, in this CPI. Uh, I'm, um, I'm inclined to believe that um, we're going to be, be, continue to be surprised by how quickly inflation moderates down to 2 to 2.5%, two which I think is, will be achieved by the end of uh, next year. Ed, one of the things that could have a significant impact or a negative impact on inflation is the oil price. It's been very volatile this year. It wasn't at too long ago. It was at $95 a barrel, went all the way down to the low 70s. Yep. And it's it's subject to a lot of headline risk, especially coming out of the Middle East. But what are your thoughts on oil? Well, there's a lot of it. Uh, clearly, the, the Saudis and the Russians and anybody else who exports oil would love to see the price at 100. Uh, I think there's a recognition among the exporters that, uh, or there's, there's there's a perception that maybe they could get 100, but they're not going to push for any higher than that because that might cause a recession. So they tried it, and the Saudis and uh, the Saudis and the Russians cut back their production uh, since last summer, and the price price of oil went went up, as you said. Uh, but then it's come right back down. Um, I think we've seen demand destruction. I think we've seen Americans. Uh, simply cut back on the amount of traveling they do. Uh, I mean, electric vehicles are getting adopted, so that's a, that, that, that's a negative for, for demand. Uh, I think also a lot of people uh, these days are working from home. They're not commuting uh, to, work, to work as much. And uh, so if the price of, of gasoline goes up, when they do their local chores, they may do them, kind, kind of consolidate them. And, and, but the reality is we've seen a decline in the demand for gasoline in the United States. So um, the, the price matters, and the, the price can't have a depressing impact on demand, which is why it's come back down. The, the old saying, the best cure for high commodity prices, particularly oil and gasoline prices, is high prices, because then demand uh, starts to, to kick in. And also, we've had uh, U.S. Uh, oil field production going back to its record high of about 13 million barrels per day. Uh, but uh, clearly, if the war between uh, Israel and Gaza uh, becomes even more regional. I mean, clearly there's the shooting going on uh, in, in Iraq, uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, the uh, Houthis in Yemen are uh, creating problems um, on the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. Uh, that could disrupt the flow of oil, but um, uh, there's a lot of ways to, to, get, to get oil to the market. As we saw that there's a lot of fears that uh, the Europeans would take years uh, to get natural gas to replace uh, Russian natural gas. Uh, they did it in a matter of a year. And so I'm not particularly concerned about the, the geopolitical uh, issues right now. It certainly looks as though um, it's staying fairly localized between Israel and Gaza. But ask me again, obviously, if uh, it's if there's, suddenly there's a, a big war between uh, the Hezbollah in the north and Israel and you know things uh, heat up with Iran. I mean, if we get a scenario where somebody bombs Iranian oil facilities, or the Iranians uh, try to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, uh, clearly we're going to see oil prices spike up, and uh, that could very well cause a global recession. Uh, that's the risk. Uh, I don't think that's the most likely scenario. Yes, yeah, so I'm always amazed with the oil market. I think it's the most fascinating of all markets, for sure. And let's discuss the stock market now. It's like a runaway train, and S&P's up 20% on the year. The Nasdaq's up 50% on the year. Bitcoin's up 150% on the year. It's like risk on in a big way. And maybe right. it just goes back to what you were saying earlier that the market's looking ahead and it sees a strong economy. And yep. what are your thoughts on the stock market and the performance that we've seen? Because a lot of it's come just in the last four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. Do you think the market's gotten ahead of itself? Any concerns? Well, you know, you asked asking the wrong guy because I've been bullish for a while, so I, I have that uh, bias. Um, and uh, I mean, in no November of uh, last year, early November last year, um, I argued that um, the market might have made it low in October, and uh, benefit of hindsight, that turned out to be the case. Uh, and um, I was uh, forecasting uh, at the end of uh, last year that we get to 4,600 uh, by now. And um, it got there basically in July, at the end of July of, of this year, then it kind of stayed stayed with my 4,600 uh, target, figuring there might be a correction. There was a very traditional 10% correction. Uh, then um, I, I did think that uh, within a few days, the, 
the October low uh, correction low uh, looked looked to me as though that was a good good buying point. And we've had this uh, straight up uh, rally uh, since then, and now we're above my target, so I wasn't bullish enough. Dang it, I wish I was, you know. Maybe I should have called 4,800. But look, guys, instead of uh, talking about year-end targets, I'm talking about next year's being 5,400, um, which, again, I started talking about a year ago. And now um, I'm looking at 6,000 on the S&P 500 by the end of uh, 2025. And that's all predicated on uh, the, uh, my uh, view that uh, earnings are going to be better than expected. Uh, so 250, $250 a share for the S&P 500 uh, this this year, uh, next year, up from 220, 25 uh, this year, and then uh, 270 dollars a share in uh, 2025, uh, and then 300 dollars a share in uh, 2026. So uh, that's all kind of consistent. Uh, with my roaring 2020s uh, scenario, uh, I've been pointing out that uh, really since the beginning of the decade that this could either turn out to be uh, the ro roaring 2020s or something else. And uh, by 2021, it uh, became obvious that it could be the 1970s all over again with uh, inflation uh, spiking up, uh, the Fed pushing rates to levels that cause a recession. And there's a lot of similarities. Uh, and it could still happen. We could still have a double peak in uh, you know, oil price, another oil shock would certainly make it deja vu all over again. Uh, but I think like the 1920s, we're seeing tremendous uh, technologies that have the potential to increase productivity, which then in turn uh, lead to prosperity. They lead to increasing uh, wages relative to prices. Uh, profits uh, remain high. Uh, real GDP is uh, better than expected, which helps to reduce the federal deficit burden, which is probably the the biggest problem I worry about, but uh, you know, right now the bond market uh, was worrying about it this summer. It's not worrying about it now. So the the bottom line is uh, an optimistic outlook for the rest of the decade, uh, a, te a technology led uh, productivity boom. Ed, there's a record amount of money sitting in money market funds. Everybody's trying to collect their four or five percent the easy way. Yeah. And if that money was deployed, do you think this could also have a positive impact on the stock market? Yeah, going abs absolutely. There's over five trillion there. There's seventeen trillion dollars in uh, bank deposits. Uh, they are getting a better return on their money than they did a couple of years ago. But uh, it's conceivable that uh, when the Fed starts lowering interest rates, uh, people will start getting nervous about uh, being in short-term instruments and want to go well uh, longer. By then, they'll probably wind up. Uh, buying uh, at the top rather than getting any particular bargain. But yeah, that's uh, s still a possibility. There, There is a lot of liquidity. It's, it's funny uh, the, about liquidity. When the market's going down, everybody says liquidity is dried up. When the market's going up, there's ample liquidity. Uh, but the data actually shows that there's plenty of liquidity. There's plenty of money in liquid assets. Uh, people got uh, burned over the past couple of years in the bond market, the stock market, and say, okay, not going to take any risk. I'm going to just buy money market instruments or deposits. Uh, but that could become a less compelling argument if rates start actually coming down. But I, I don't think they, you know, I don't think rates are going to come down that much. I don't think a lot of the money is going to pour out of liquid assets because their yield suddenly plunges. Uh, I think uh, my happy scenario can happen simply because the economy is doing well, earnings are doing well, uh, valuation multiples stay high because of the uh, hoopla about uh, the technology revolution. Uh, some people will call it hype, and I'll, I'll be arguing that it's 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 for real. How shocked do you think people are going to be when they get their year-end statements and they see how oh, they made four or five percent, and then they yeah. see the benchmark S and P 500, let's just say, up 20 percent? Like right. it's next to impossible to make that up. Yeah, that's uh, it's not something that one can make up. So you just kind of, you know, ac accept the reality of uh, underperforming relative uh, to uh, to, uh, to other areas. But a lot of people are making conscious decisions to do that. Uh, you know, the the markets have been just too volatile for them, um, and I think that's partly because uh, uh, because of Wall Street's pessimism. Uh, Wall Street managed to get a lot of people out of the stock market uh, early last year. It's just uh, the the bearish pessimists on Wall Street forget forgot to get them back in. Uh, so uh, th th this kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Warren Buffett and uh, Jeremy Siegel camp that believes that stocks should be held for the long run and 
trying to you know pick tops and uh, figure that, and believe that you can also pick the bottom is uh, would be a, a, an amazing uh, feat. And, and I'm glad you brought that point up because when you listen to Main Street Media or it doesn't matter, you know, quite a few uh, YouTubers, right, for that matter. But a lot of what we read and hear and, and watch, it's very negative, right? Yeah. And here was a great example of that. And as a result, so many people put their money into, you know, money market funds. And meanwhile, the S&P and the NASDAQ just ripped. But what advice would you give to investors? How do you block out all of this noise? Well, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to block out the noise. You have to have a, a, a fundamental optimism in the in the economy. I mean, the economy's done remarkably well uh, over the years, notwithstanding uh, all the crises we've had. A lot of people uh, focus on the headline news coming out of Washington, what the Fed's doing, what the Treasury is doing, Congress, uh, the White House. And uh, I remain uh, amazed, impressed by how, how well our economy does <laughs> despite Washington. Uh, and it's because there's a lot of us that uh, get up in the morning and go to work, and the working stiffs of, uh, uh, among us who, who go to work and try to make it, you know, Make it a, make it a better uh, life for our ourselves, our children, our families, uh, our communities, and, and our country. And uh, you know, we're just kind of too busy to get too political about what's going on. But then again, we come home and watch the news, and it's like, oh, how depressing c could that be? When we forget just how how much effort we put into offsetting this, uh, taking into account uh, the the hurdles that uh, policymakers and politicians create for us, and uh, the economy has been great, and the stock market has been reflecting that uh, very, very well. So I, I think you, you, you buy yourself the the old scenario of a diversified portfolio, and in my roaring 2020 scenario, technology you know, with, within that uh, semiconductors still make uh, sense, even though they're not as cheap as they had been. Uh, financials have also had a big uh, rebound here since the banking crisis earlier this year, but financials still look uh, good. Industrials look very good because uh, we're onshoring, so we're building a lot of factories and we're gonna have to stock stock them with all sorts of capital equipment and technologies. Uh, so there's still uh, opportunities there. Um, I think once the bond market settles down, maybe if it'll settle down around four, four and a quarter percent, that'll probably be a, a decent uh, return for anybody who wants to have some uh, long-term uh, re return locked in, but recognizing that uh, they might miss a better return uh, with more volatility. If you can't take the volatility, you know, if, if you find that you know you wind up uh, buying at the top and selling at the bottom uh, on a regular basis, then it's probably a, a conservative approach with fixed income might, might make more sense or very conservative uh, stocks. You mentioned that you like to take the same approach as Warren Buffett, and I also am a big fan of his. And I think one of his best quotes is, never bet against America. And I, that's my, uh, I completely agree with that. And as we wrap up, you've been very bullish, and I'm curious what it would take to change your view on, on that perspective. Well, uh, yeah, I, I just could I could be dead wrong on inflation. It could make a comeback. I don't think so. Um, I think it uh, is turning out to be transitory. I think, uh, you know, there's the, the, you asked me about what the pessimists got wrong. I think a lot of them had this view that the only way to bring inflation down was to have a recession in the U.S. And I've been pointing out that uh, actually we have had a recession. In the United States, it's been a rolling recession, uh, but the overall economy has grown. But more importantly, China and Europe. Have done us the favor of having the necessary recession to bring inflation down. China's you know, China's uh, property market is a d disaster. Uh, their stock market's down 50% uh, from its peak a couple of years ago, and uh, so there's been a tremendous negative wealth effect over in China. And as a result, they've got deflation. Their CPI and PPI uh, inflation rates are, are falling a bit, and they're exporting deflation to the to the rest of the world. Uh, so that's all worked out uh, pretty well. Suddenly, the Chinese uh, come up with a way to really stimulate their economy, and uh, we see that in oil prices going up, copper prices going up. Uh, then, I, you know, and I see more inflationary pressures. I'll uh, rethink my my optimism. Uh, 
clearly the federal deficit's out of control. Fiscal policy is out of control in the United States. Uh, but again, um, that seemed to be a big issue this summer. And then all of a sudden, the bond market focused on uh, what the what the Fed's interest rate outlook was, what inflation is doing, and so you know that's a problem for another day. I mean, there's nothing we can do, uh, practically speaking, about the federal deficit between now and the elections next year. Uh, so I think the markets are saying that'll be an issue for after the elections. If if we're still running profligate uh, fis fiscal uh, policies, uh, then uh, we may find that the bond yield goes right back up again. Uh, closer to 5% as sort of a protest by uh, my friends, the bond vigilantes. Uh, you know, I came up with that term back in uh, the early 80s. Uh, the, the financial market still could uh, you know, conclude that uh, our, our policymakers uh, need to hear a, a, a loud scream of disapproval. But um, again, that's not something I see happening anytime soon. Well, that was a fascinating discussion, Ed. If our viewers would like to learn more about you and the services that you offer, where can they go? Well, we did, uh, by popular demand, uh, put together a research service for individual investors. It's affordable. Uh, it's uh, www.yardeni, Y-A-R-D-E-N-I, quicktakes.com, yardeniquicktakes.com. Uh, and what that does is every day, or almost every day, tries to give you an insight of how the economic indicators that have come out and are about to come out might uh, impact the uh, the, econ the econ not just the economy but the financial markets. So it's uh, very much um, it's a, an area that's uh, discussed but in the headlines, but it's not really analyzed very uh, carefully. So the Fed obviously uh, is an important issue that uh, Fed policy is an important issue that we cover on a regular basis. Uh, and then for institutional investors, we uh, you you would go to yardeni.com uh, and uh, get a trial for that uh, that service. And you have to mention your YouTube channel. I'm a follower. Yeah, um, with a one week delay, we uh, put my weekly uh, YouTube's um, uh, webcasts, and uh, they usually they, they last. Uh, I try to keep it to exactly half an hour, and uh, I chat a little bit about. You know what's what's ahead during the week, um, an analysis of, you know, where the economy is and inflation's heading and Fed policy, and then we look at some uh, supporting uh, data by looking at charts. Yes, I would highly suggest it to our viewers. Well, Ed, that was a great discussion. I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today, and I look forward to our next discussion. Absolutely, thank you very much. Happy holidays. And the same to you.